It's a real pleasure to have Enrique Pujols here today. He'll talk about understanding generic dynamics of phenomenon mechanism correspondence. Okay, thank you so much for inviting me. So what I want to talk is very generic, so you want something to be specified. We stop there and we move to the blackboard and the So there's nothing. I, I don't have to stick to the to any two slides. It's one hour and fifteen minutes. Yeah. Well, oh. it's it's a flexible hour. Okay. Look. Yeah, that's a good way to describe it. What? It's a good way to describe it. Yeah, it will be fifteen minutes. So the next class in here starts <laughs> at four. <laughs> so there is the, the setting that we're going to work with. It's a very particular setting in dynamics, which is CR maps acting on a smooth compact manifold. So I only focus on this case, but you can say almost everything that is written there about ODEs or vector fields acting on a manifold. But in any case, it has to be a smooth compact manifold sometimes with boundary or without boundary. And the situation changed dramatically when you put the boundary in the picture. And this is like a kind of common ground in people working in dynamics, that one of the goals in dynamics after Poincaré is try to describe the dynam dynamical behavior of the majority of systems. Of course, this is extremely vague. It's an ambiguous sentence, and you have to specify which it means to describe and which is the dynamical behavior and what is the majority. So in certain sense, uh, through the colloquium or whatever I'm going to say, is trying to say something more specific about the sentence. And to describe, uh, roughly speaking, is what people do in dynamics. So you have a map, and then you're taking an initial condition, and you iterate the map. And you would like to say something about the asymptotical behavior of this trajectory. Where are the accumulation points? If there are tractors, if the, this trajectory maybe is periodic, to say something. And it will be extremely ambitious to say something about all trajectory, but at least for the majority of them, for it's an almost initial condition. And majority is a little bit more well established. And sometimes it's a topological approach. So here you have the set of dynamics, so here we put diffeomorphisms, and there is CR maps. <coughs> you have the set of diffeomorphisms, and is you don't want to describe all the dynamics, but at least a generic set or a dense set of dynamics. But it's more a topological approach. And sometimes people try to work with finite parameter, uh, parameter family, so you have a family of dynamics that they are parameter, parameterized, number of parameters finite. And they wanted to say something for representative dynamics, or the representative uh, finite parameter family. Let's say, let's clarify what mean representative. One way to do it is like uh, to recall a result that have been found in the last 10 years for the quadratic family, and just is there is one of the places where it's kind of where it was possible to say a lot are either using this approach or this approach, which is the quadratic family. The quadratic family is just a family of endomorphisms acting on the interval. So x is the variable on the interval, r is the parameter. For each r, there is one endomorphism. So the Interval 0, 1 is an attracting region for R between 0 and 4. And what have been proved, and it was proved by Lubitsch, that for almost all parameters, of almost every parameter, you have two different type of behaviors. Either is, there is one attracting periodic point, or there is one attracting periodic point, and almost every initial condition, will, or almost every trajectory, will convert to this attracting fixed point. Or there is an interval, smaller than 0, 1, with the property that the forward trajectory for all of every point is going to be dense. So you have these two type of behavior. The first one, people call it regular. The second one, call it chaotic. In fact, it's possible to show that in the second one, the dynamic is also a body. This is 
a parametric version. This is for almost every parameter. If you look from a topological point of view, what is re a prevalent is the first one. Because there is an open and then set of parameters where there is only one attracting uh, periodic trajectories and almost every point goes there. The rest may be second or set. The sets of points that do not go to this attracting periodic point could be a counter set. Okay, this is extremely ambitious. Um, people are extremely far away to prove something similar for two-dimensional dynamics. But at least it's a clear, maybe it's a dream theorem. And in the sense that everybody would like to have something similar for the majority of dynamics, for endomorphism or diffeomorphism in any manifold. Anyhow, this gives two different dynamical phenomena. So this is a good example of talking about different dynamical phenomena. So one was this attracting periodic trajectory and almost every point going to the attracting periodic trajectory, or the trajectory are going to be dense in an interval. There are two different dynamical phenomena, and it's an idea to have this kind of classification. You would like to have a classification like this on dynamical phenomena. So there are certain conjectures in this dilation. This is this conjecture by Pallis that says that what you have you, what it was done for quadratic family, maybe it's possible to be done for any uh, finite parameter family. And he says something more specific about what is representative. He talks about generic finite parameter family. And the quadratic family is much more clear because in certain sense, what happened in the quadratic family, it will happen for any unimodal maps. Which is unimodal maps? The model maps are maps that only have one critical point. So you have a family of dynamics like one, one that has one critical point. The type of description that was done for the quadratic have, can be done for any one. And this is the beauty of having this kind of universal family. It's not clear this kind of universality is possible in higher dimension. So people say, OK, I'd like to talk about generic finite parameter family. For this generic, whatever it is, uh, finite parameter family, for almost any parameters, there's going to exist a finite number of transient attractors. Put the word at body, but basically what it has the manifold. So it will be finite number of attractors, <coughs> which is an attractor. Well, they have the many definitions, but one definition that you can put is the following. There is an open set such that any point in this open set is going to converge, the forward orbits is going to converge to, to this attractor. One, two, three attractors. And the, theory, the, the conjecture th says that almost every initial condition goes to one of the attractors. So there are certain things that maybe does not go anywhere. Well, does not go to the attractor all this. So this is the two parts. Other way to say is that you put the hard measure of the union of the basins of attraction is total. But the important part is also that the attractor is kind of transitive. Now what does it mean to be transitive? is that there exists the trajectory which is S. That's right. So why do you care about transitivity? Because transitivity is kind of the basic piece in dynamics. You say that this object is dynamically undecomposable. So you cannot put it in different parts. Because if you have a trajectory of visiting everything, in certain sense this is like the dynamical undecomposable and a composable piece. Okay. <clears throat> do we believe it? So some people believe it, some people do not believe it. And in fact I think that there are many people working and trying to disprove it. Um, and I think that it's I think that it's false. I'm going to be I bet in a, in a year it's going to be disproved. <laughs> so just to say something that maybe <laughs> maybe in a year somebody's going to talk why it's false. Um, but the idea is like, a, it's very ambitious, and people are still exploring 
different type of dynamical scenario or phenomena. So in the quadratic family, there were two types of dynamical phenomena. And here, really, when you start to go higher dimension, still there are so much uh, behavior that they are not well understood. So this is a reason that maybe going up in higher dimension, the situation can change dramatically and will bring a different picture in dynamics. OK, so the idea is like uh, what they want to focus now, and basically this is the rest of the talk, is this how to explore different type of dynamical scenarios. So on one hand, you would like to make like a list of all different type of dynamical phenomena. What is a dynamical phenomenon? Well, I'm not saying Nash here. So it's some kind of well-described dynamical behavior. So which is a well-described dynamical behavior? Or for instance, you say that the trajectory is periodic. It's very clear. That there is an attractor. So it means that it's an open set of initial conditions such that all the trajectory converge to one of the transitive pieces. It could be that some well-dynamical behavior, there are a finite number of them. But it also could be like they are infi infinite and, they are, and even is saying something not just for one system, but for a large class of systems. So, so for instance, it's some kind of, kind of description where you want for a large class of system, you have infinitely many attractors. This is kind of description. But uh, I'm yes. confused. Wasn't the conjecture that there was a finite number of The conjecture is finite. And he but, believe it. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 it is funny because like, it, the conjecture says that it's finite for generic parametric families. And in fact, there are examples where there are infinitely many attractors. And this is a residual set of dynamics. So there are, and I think the conjecture, the, there is something uh, wacky on this conjecture that is confusing, I think, that is confusing two terminology. One is the notion of genericity, which is a totally uh, topological notion and the notion of form of any parameter, which is measure theoretical. And sometimes, so for instance, in the quadratic family, you already have, so let me go back. If you look for measure theoretical, this phenomenon that there is a dense trajectory in an interval, this is a, for a set of positive measure of parameter. But if you look only for, you say, what happened for the majority from a topological point of view, this is the only phenomenon that you see. So for an open and then set, so the same happened for irrational rotation. So maps on the rotation or whatever, uh, circle diffeomorphism. From the point of view of topology, there is only a finite number of trajectories. From the point of view of measure theoretical, you see irrational rotation. So it's like a, so, uh, so uh, you use the word generic, you're referring to the parameters in the family? In here, no, generic, so in the same way that you can... about the points in one... Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, so you have a set of diffeomorphisms, and you can talk about a generic set of diffeomorphisms. Right. So this is a Banach space, and then you can use the notion of the genericity. But also you can talk about finite, let's put it, finite, let's say K, parameter family. Right. And also it's a... Um, So now it's also a parameter, so it's also a Banach space. Right. And you talk about the a generic family of parameter, uh, and inside each family, almost mm -hmm. every point. Uh -huh. Okay. And one other silly question, if you have infinitely many attractors and it happens to have a con these, these converge to something, can you say something about the limit point? Of the well, in, yes, so the, the idea is you have infinitely many attractors, we will see these examples. You have that almost, a, maybe almost every point converts to one of these attractors. Right. Um, and in parametric family, it will have zero measure. Uh -huh. If this conjecture is true for parametric family, it will have zero measure. Right. But it's not clear that for generic family it's going to have zero measure. Uh -huh. So it's like, a, and in fact, maybe it's possible to build up generic family that they have infinitely. So what happened at genericity does not, does not see what happened for, from a the measure of theoretical point of view. Uh -huh. And so maybe, is there a reason that genericity 
I was given this, it's totally conjectural this. But it's like, a, what's going on is like sometimes when you put together topological concepts and measure theoretical concepts, you start to see different aspects and do not combine well. Okay, so in any case, what I'm saying is like, a, what happened in the quadratic family is pretty one dimensional. And probably, or maybe, in higher dimension would appear different type of uh, new phenomena, so new behaviors. And some people in the community are still exploring this kind of new behaviors. And so well, uh, one, one goal is to produce this list of this dynamical phenomena. Um, and obviously, well characterized dynamical phenomena. And the way the, that some people do it is trying to build models of dynamical so You don't work with equations, it's some kind of models. And these kind of models, in certain cases, are geometrical constructions. And this is a very long tradition since it's male doing this geometrical construction. And this geometrical construction will have some kind of underlying structure. Another case, it will be more based on trying to find simple configuration between uh, periodic trajectories. So you have that certain periodic trajectories and some configuration related to them. We will give the example. And they are calling mechanisms. And maybe, understand the simple configuration, new dynamical phenomena will show up. I'm hoping that this list of dynamical phenomena is not generic, but generic in the sense Again, this like any dynamic will have one of these behavior, and also trying to say that this work as a dictionary, meaning you have some phenomena here that is a clear mechanism of structure that is going to be responsible of this phenomenon. So this is a kind of dictionary. But in this dictionary, sometimes it's not like a goal in itself. It's more just a way to explore that phenomenon. Sometimes you work so this kind of make and geometrical construction are very easy to build up. And you hope that this is going to give, say, something rich on the other side. And someday when you start to see here, you came up with new concept. It's more like a, this diction is more like a scouting process. It's nothing essential in itself. Okay, so this mechanism approach, or modern mechanism approach, goes back to Poincaré, so there's nothing new here. No, it's like this is kind of well established. And goes back to Poincaré and the three body problem. No, it's like uh, basically they would use the three body problem if the three body interacted under, under their gravitational attractions. And the two body problem, the Keplerian problem, was well understood. It's like basically you have one fixed body you want, and another that is attracted to this by the gravitational force. And in the case that you have negative energy, the dynamic is an elliptic motion, or if you want, a periodic motion. And so the goal to point of Poincaré was to try to see the three-body problem as a perturbation of the two-body problem. Actually, he focused on the restricted three-body problem, that is a very particular case of the three-body problem. The, three -body, the restricted three-body, basically, it's like you have a two-body interaction between this and the third one. <coughs> that is going to be, it's not affecting these two guys. So the third one, so small that it's not affecting this. But there is one body that affected more than the other. So this is my measures one, epsilon, and this is measure, uh, mass equals zero. So this is the mass. So this is like a way to, just a first approximation of the three-body problem. And it's just a common place to say that Poincaré realized that trajectories on this situation are very complicated. So that be a new type of very complicated trajectory. And he thought that this complicated trajectory were related to homoclinic points. And homoclinic points are points with the same past and future. So you have a point. Of course, here is continuous dynamic, and we were talking about discrete dynamics. So you have a point, you have the backward orbit. And it's positive. And here the forward orbit. And there are cumulus somewhere, and the cumulus here, and there is a relation between these guys. 
So for him, this was the complete points. Points that do not accumulate in itself, but the backward orbit and the forward orbit, they have some relation. Um, this is like a clear example. So what I'm not okay, you nothing to you here. So here you have a fixed point. So this is a fixed point. The red curve is the set of point, the set of point in this region that the forward trajectory converts to the fixed point. And the blue one is the set of point that the backward uh, orbit accumulate also in the fixed point. And this far away, so this is typically what happened in the pendulum. You have the pendulum dynamics, this is what happened. You have an equilibrium point. And you have the set of points that forward convert here, and the set of points that backward they convert here, they intersect. So this is, if you want to think in the pendulum, this is the equilibrium point of the pendulum, it's on the top. And so, and then you have the trajectory that convert there and there. There is no reason that these two manifolds, and in fact, what's possible to prove that these sets are some manifolds, do not have to coincide, they could intersect. And after when Gale Birkov realized that when you have this kind of transversal intersection between these two sets, stable and stable, so this gives rise to much more complicated dynamics. So not only you are going to have a fixed point, but you are going to have infinitely many periodic trajectories. So, and in fact, there was one of the examples of being a chaotic dynamics. Chaotic is very clear, means that points are going to move away one from the other, either for the future or for the past. So this is the notion of being chaotic. So the two initial conditions are going to separate for the future or the past. And robust means that even if you perturb the system, you're still having the same phenomenon. And in any case, this has been one study, it's a clear example, it's a fair example of mechanisms that produce a rich dynamical phenomenon. So we start to see that, what is the goal of the dictionary? Here is a clear example of a simple configuration. So you have a fixed point. This is one element of your dynamics. A stable set and a stable set, and having this transversal intersection. You call this a mechanism. And these mechanisms produce a kind of complicated dynamics that have which consequence, for instance, the existence of infinitely many periodic So There's not, nothing that only for the system, but any for one. Um, many years later, in fact, it's in the 2002. So this kind of approach gave the first classification, the first classification theory in dynamics. Not the first classification, one a rough classification using this approach mechanisms. And here is now appear in which topology you are going to be working. Here says C1 generically. So you have a set of diffeomorphisms, but you put only the C1 topology. It's very restrictive. So C1 generically, what you are going to see either the dynamic is very simple, and very simple means if your dynamic is symplectic, conservative, what you have is a, a total integrable system, like a pendulum for in dimension two, or Morse male, and Morse male means a few words, the following. You have your manifold, you have a finite number of attractors, but the attractors are periodic trajectories. And almost every point is going to convert to one of these periodic trajectories. So it's like uh, this ideal description of having a finite number of attractors where everything goes. This is a typical Morse's male, but the attractor is just a periodic trajectory. This is a one just a simple way to say Morse's male. So either you have this very simple dynamic, or there are transversal nuclear points. So it's like, a, this in particular, you have this chaotic component. So in certain sense, you say, well, if I have my dynamics, either can be approximated by, by one, that they have this transversal nuclear points, and therefore infinitely many, infinite many periodic trajectories and chaos, or you have very, very simple dynamics. So, this is only happening in the C1 topology, or well, no, it's not happening on the C1 topology, it's only understood in the C1 topology. 
And there are reasons, and the reasons are technical. We will see what happens <laughs> when you move to higher topology. But well, still, this gives a playground. The C1 topology gives a playground where people can understand something. Because it's not a problem in itself, so working on the C1 topology, but it's a way to try to say something about relevant internal dynamics. <clears throat> okay, but transversal and points, they weren't just a nice mechanism, but also it's like a, it's a source of a theory. You know? So they were so rich that on, on, over on them it was built up a theory. And for a long time, it had been known as hyperbolic theory or hyperbolic dynamics. And whatever is hyperbolic dynamics, is everything is almost encoded in this picture. So, which is this is a smelly horseshoes. And the smelly horseshoes is just a geometrical construction, which is just to pick up this square, stretch on one direction, contract on the other, and pick it back. So, this is. So the beauty of, I think, the beauty of this picture is kind of easy to, under, to be understood. And whatever you go into learning in a, in, a, in a course on hyperbolic dynamics, you can say everything on this picture. So you have this chaotic dynamics. This can be also encoded in, in a symbolic dynamics. It's possible to understand that the set of points that are going to remain Forever in the region for forward and backward iterating is going to be a product of two counter set. But it's not just a picture of what is essential. <coughs> is what I was saying that it's a structure. That they are basically two complementary behavior. One in the horizontal, everything is stretched, and one in the vertical is squeeze. So you have a contraction of the vertical and a squeeze on the horizontal. So, and this is dynamic on the tangent bundle. It's not a dynamic on the manifold. The idea that this richness, or whatever, this simple tangent bundle dynamics gives a lot of information about what happened on the, the ambient manifold. Um, but again, so hyperbolicity, they have two consequences. Oh, and many, but particular ones. It would happen for a complete dynamic, not for a complete, for one system, and what happened in relation with the perturbed ones. So uh, playing around with this expansion or squeeze and contraction uh, was possible to show this there are certain instability of trajectory. So this is the reason that we call it chaotic because when you are stretching in this way, trajectories are going to separate forwardly. If you are stretching on this, so you contract in this way, you are going to stretch for backward iterate. Um, so you have stability of trajectory, which made the dynamic chaotic of the produced randomness and this type of transitivity. But in any case, this is the source to have a nice uh, statistical description of the system. So whatever it was about news in terms of complicated trajectory, it's good if you start to do a statistical description. So on the other hand, what happens when you perturb your system? Your system is hyperbolic. This is, again, now this is a property on the tangent bound. So you have your manifold, and here is the tangent bound. <coughs> so this is the action of the derivative, and here is the action of the manifold. So, to, how do you say it? To lie or to cheat a little bit, basically this looks like a hyperbolic matrix. So it's a matrix that have two dimensions. One is the contraction, one is expansion. You have a matrix nearby, you still have the same. Obviously, it's not going to be diagonal. So you will have some epsilon here, epsilon here, and also here. But still a hyperbolic matrix. So this means that, in certain way, this structure is a kind of robust. But there is a way to prove it. It's not easy, but it's possible to improve. And this produces stability. But not stability for a system, but a stability in the sense that uh, you have your hyperbolic model, and, or dynamic, and you have a perturbed one. There is a conjugacy between both of them. So what does it mean, a conjugacy? It means the following. So you have your map. Right here. F and G 
And so there is an homeomorphism that is going to conjugate both dynamics. It's an homeomorphism. Do not require to be a diffeomorphism because otherwise there are not examples. There are no open set of examples. And this means that under a CC, the change of variable, the dynamic is the same. If this guy has a periodic point, this guy has a periodic point of the same period, etc. So all the dynamical behavior on this, the topological property of the dynamical behavior of this can be translated on topological behavior on that. So they are C0 conjugate. And in fact, it was conjecture that uh, the sta uh, if you see a stability, this means that you see this, then you have hyperbolicity. This is a conjecture by Pallis and Smail. Oh, sorry, no. And what is having proved that you have C1 stability, then you have hyperbolicity. So what it was proved that in fact this if you have this uh, phenomena in the C1 topology, this means that you consider G a C1 perturbation of F, then your dynamic have to have this kind of hyperbolic structure. So the, the thing you're conjugating by is also C1? No, no, C0. That's, that's it's only C0. C0. Okay. What happens if you ask for C1 conjugate, the conjugation, you never will have, will have an open set of dynamics that have this conjugacy property. Uh -huh. So the asking for C1 conjugacy is not an open property. It will not produce open examples. So can you sort of say, I mean, uh, this H, for example, is now finite piecewise. I mean, it can say something about the number of points where it's discontinuous, or I mean, any conditions at all that you can put on what the H can be get the family working? Well, it, yes, so for example, but so, for example, you have a fixed point. Uh, say, suppose that you have a fixed point. F has a fixed point, then G has a fixed point. Right. So P is a fixed point for F, H of P is a fixed point for G. Uh -huh. You ask that H is C1, this is going to produce a conjugacy also in the derivative. Uh -huh. So if the derivative is, if you want, as, uh, forget, that, suppose that F is one dimensional. So the, the derivative, in, on the point is a number, 3. Mm -hmm. But it's so easy to change 3 to 3 minus epsilon. Mm -hmm. so, um, so small, so you have to have this. Of mm -hmm. course, this is what people know as rigidity. Yeah. And it's important to understand the class of rigidity. And it's a technical, uh, mm -hmm. it's not a technical, it's a problem itself. And it gives a lot of consequence. For instance, to understand the quadratic family, you want to understand the uh, what is the class of system that has certain rigidity property. So it's not that it's, I'm not dismissing the problem, I it's one of the main tools and that is used in a way to prove certain type of result. And if you want one of the dreamer results, you have to understand this part. Uh, but on this kind of vague uh, analysis, uh, asking for C1 conjugacy would be a lot. And what does it mean C1 is stable? So if you have, you can have two systems that they are C1 flows and really far away C, in the C2 topology. No? And so, uh, so there is a difference to us between C1 stability and C2 stability. It's the, the CR category is not about the order of the differentiability of the conjugacy. It's about which is the topology of your dynamics. In the space of dynamics. So you're asking these two guys are C1 close and conjugate. Asking that they are C2 close is more, much more restricted. So you are compared to a lot of systems in the C1 topology, and you do this comparison, then it's possible to prove that the dynamic hyperbolic. This was proved by Manier back in the 80s. Um, and this technique is, and this result is totally unknown in the CR category. It's totally unknown. Um, and the reason that many of the results are based on perturbation techniques. So you want to perturb your dynamic and to perturb, uh, sometimes you produce local perturbations. Um, and this is what I understood in only the C1 category. The, the simple problem is the following. So you can, 
Forget the whole predicted trajectory in principle. So what is a predicted trajectory? Is the totally more general set, which is a recurrent set. Which is a recurrent set. It's a point that is going the forward into is coming arbitrarily close. So you have this point, and the trajectory coming arbitrarily close. It's not periodic. You will like to say, well, this loop almost periodic. So you say, well, could I perturb in a way to produce, to produce a periodic trajectory? The answer is yes in the C1 topology. So if you do it just a C1 perturbation, it's unknown in the CR. So there is, um, the starting point of this, con of this proof is I will say that you have many periodic trajectories. I will talk about this on Wednesday. So how to deal when you do not have uh, CR perturbation techniques. And there are other ways, some, sometimes more like topological tools, etc. Okay, and so this conjecture is totally open. It's, so one way of the conjecture is totally open in CR topology, and there are no advance. So really, it's like almost no advance. It's true in the for endomorphisms, so uh, multimodal maps of the interval. Here. Okay. Now, on the other hand, I was wanted to say that there is oh, not only stability. Of course, if you have this stability, you have this robust transitivity. What's mean robust transitivity? If this guy is transitive, this means that it has a dense trajectory in, in an attractor or in the whole space, and there is a conjugacy, these guys also have a dense trajectory. So if this trajectory, so what happens is that this trajectory is going to be sent to, you put h here, uh, this by h is going to be sent on gm of h. But if it's dense, and h is a, conju is a conjugacy, it's a zero, then this is also the dense trajectory. And this is the reason why you ask about conjugacy and not just by section. Because you want to produce some information on the closure of trajectory, not just on the trajectory itself. And so if one system is it has a dense trajectory, the perturbed ones also have a dense trajectory. So this is called robust transitivity. And so one problem was okay, so you understand people understand what is this C1 stability, but it's the same as robust transitivity. Are this this by this it's true that you can come back. And this is was a new area where I think that is a key example well, then the answer is no, let's see. Let me make a cartoon of what is robust transitivity. It's a very bad cartoon over there. So here you have the diffeomorphisms. The blue set is an open set in diffeomorphisms. F is one diffeo, and here one attractor, or whatever, one set, which is this, whatever, this is team. It's a set of points that remain inside U for forward and backward iterates. And so say, okay, for F, I have this set which is transitive. To be robust transitive means that you change F for G, the set of trajectory remaining U is also a transitive set. So for any system in here, you can associate this lambda G or lambda F, which is a set of trajectory remaining here, and you wonder if your set is transitive or not. To be robust transitive means that whenever you perturb, you want to remain with the set that is transitive. And the question was, does robust transitivity imply hyperbolicity? So, and in fact, this was a good example of how a theory sometimes build up new examples. So this is the idea of what I was trying to say about dictionary. It's not like a sometimes theory are interesting in itself because it gives you what the reference where you want to build up a new example that do not fit in the theory. <laughs> So it's like more like a scouting process. And the answer is yes for surface diffeomorphism. So in fact, C1 robust transitivity implies hyperbolicity. The proof is the same proof for the C1 stability conjecture. But it's false in higher dimension. On the first example, it was done by my shoe so of non-hyperbolic robust transitive systems. Systems which are transitive and do not fit in this theory. So this theory is really bad. Um, I will try to give a simple example. It's not going to prove 
why this is written in broad translate, but they did the following. So let me give this example because maybe it's is of more. And there's two thirds. We got a horseshoe. Horseshoe remains that is this one they have the hydraulic structure, this smell horseshoe. And then you take a pendulum, or a perturbed pendulum, even you want to do conservative simulation. So, and then do the product. So on the first variable, you have this transitive dynamic, and the other one, you have something like this. So it's the pendulum or the perturbed pendulum. What happened, so here I'm perturbing even everything in the, integral, in the conservative case for the second body. So the dynamic here, there's no chance that it's going to be transitive. No? So the pendulum, the, the face space of the pendulum, like this, you know, this fixed point, you know, the liquid point, and all this trajectory, and which is this? And this is the pendulum in the rest position. This is the pendulum in the other rest position that is unstable. And this trajectory means the periodic motion of the pendulum. And that's it. When you perturb that, and this is from Poincaré, or you want Poincaré is now. Of course, the system is not going to be integral. You go into see chaotic phenomena, or chaotic regions, but they are this one is going to be whatever, destroyed. But there are many of these invariant curves that in certain sense will persist. So what means that in your initial condition here, you will remain there, you will never go up there. So this curve is a German curve in the certain sense that separates the dynamic. You are here, you will go outside. It's a fence in your dynamic. So this, the, here you have infinitely many transitive components. There's no chance to be like only one piece. Um, when you couple, of course, you're still the same. If there's no transit, then you put something, whatever happens, it's also, it's just a product of something that's not transit. When you, per but what happens when you perturb, now the idea is that you use this other dynamic to shunt the fence. You use the other dynamic to shunt the fence, yeah. And so basically it's like, Instead to have one dynamic, you have two, and you iterate randomly one of the other. So when you are caught in one region, you jump to the other, and you iterate, and if you do not coincide with the other dynamic, you move away. So this is, you want to go, like, here you move to the left, and here you move to the right. And so if you are here, you always go to the left, if you are here, you always go to the right, but you can jump, and you can jump randomly, you produce this kind of, uh, random, uh, you can produce trajectories that go one from one side to the other. So this is the idea. So it's really a cartoon, but essentially we see what happened. And in fact, uh, people that work in normal diffusion use this geometrical construction of the basic mechanisms to produce the transfer of energy. So it's like a you have it, for instance, it's like a, you want to think in terms of mechanic pro, mechanical problem. So here, the different regions are positioned with different energies. But when you couple with the system that is hyperbolic, you can produce a transfer of energy of this region to other regions that are outside. So this is the... So I think that this is a nice example, uh, because also it's not... This theory was very good not only to show... Or when they say that you have hyperbolic theory, they say, well, let's build up something that is not hyperbolic. So how you do it? By capital something that is hyperbolic, but something is not hyperbolic. So vector here, they are not going to be a stretch or contract. You are in this curve, the derivative is identity, basically. So you appear in your region that is not hyperbolic. Okay, it's a nice example. And um, brings new <laughs> phenomena. But also this geometrical construction, it was like a, a Good point of reference for people that are working in concrete problems of symplectic dynamics, how to produce this kind of final diffusion. So this is like a thing that is a good example where a theory gives like indication which area to be exploring. So in any case, this is I call weak form of hyperbolicity. People call it partially hyperbolicity, but let's it's not to say with form of hyperbolicity. And this was the way to produce this non-hyperbolic transitive system. But 
also you have better situation when you have this we were looking about C1 robot transitivity implied that you have it with hyperbolism. So what is good? So it's not just an example. With hyperbolism, it's a little more general. I don't want to get into details. But what is important that this is this weak hyperbolic structure is the reason that you have this C1 robust behavior. C1 robust behavior. Sorry, do you require the decomposition something that's the no, uh, no. Well, for instance, if the dynamic is symplectic, the dimension of this and this have to be equal. If you are dealing with symplectic dynamics, it's going to force that this dimension and this is going to be the same. And in fact, there is a more general form of weak hyperbolicity that is only saying the following. They have two dimensions, complementary. And what happened, that vector here, so you don't have the expansion, but you have the volume is going to be expanded on here, and here the volume is going to be contracted for power interest. And if you expand here, you here you expand faster, let's say. And so they have a technical name, it's called dominated splitting. But basically it's like a low dominated splitting. And basically you have this decomposition of the tangent bundle dynamics in complementary relations. Um, um, the, and they have the, this dominated property means that this is a behavior that is going to be the same when you perturb it. Much easier. Take a matrix. Yeah, well now it's like the same. A and B. So what is this? A and B. It's a matrix. And you will require uh, that B divided by A is more than one. That's it. So what does it mean this? Well, you have this the relation 1, 0, and this is 0, 1. So, and you take any vector here, b. Of course, if b is more than 1, and a is more than 1, so when you iterate, this vector is going to be reduced. But if you look in terms of projective dynamics, so it means in terms of the slope, means that this vector is going to converge to this relation. So, the weak form of hyperbolicity look like a, some kind of hyperbolicity on projective dynamics. So basically it means that you have cone fields on the space. Uh, it's going down. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> Good. No, uh, B, A. Good. Yeah. Wow. yeah, exactly. So here you can put two, two, and so here you have to put three, but if you put here one half, uh, you have to put the opposite. Uh, no, one third you put here, then you put one half. Or whatever. So it means that in in the project, so it means that you have uh, basically you are far from the identity. What happened? The identity is the word because you have so many uh, eigenspace. Here you have two well defined eigenspace. Okay, and then you have this relation. This means that for the proto still you have two eigenspace. So you put it in terms of matrices, pretty clear. But the funny thing is like, uh, you say, well, what, what, what do we do with this weak form of hyperbolicity? What happens is, not only this is, because you can put any structure you want, but it would be just, uh, how do you say, a curiosity. But the nice part of this weak form of hyperbolicity that produce a lot of nice dynamical properties. So hyperbolicity, as we said before, is so grateful because you have the hyperbolic structure, which is something on the tangent bundle, says a lot on the ambient manifold. And here, this weak form of hyperbolicity also says a lot. Not as, ma not as much of hyperbolic, but says a lot. So it's a nice structure. So this is kind of, of the game. You want to introduce a nice structure, you hope that this structure or this mechanism is rich. And what is the meaning of rich? Say something more than just the definition. So, so, it like, so it produces a lot of real trajectory with a statistical property, and recently it was proved that you have this strong C1 dichotomy for conservative dynamics. And this was uh, announced by Manier a long time ago. And the proof was incomplete, and it was completed by Avila, Wilkinson, and Crovisier. And what they basically say is the recent result 
the you have either this weak hyperbolicity, this is for conservative dynamic, you have this either the weak, weak hyperbolicity, and in particular is ergodic. And what this ergodic does in the natural matter is you have a transitive piece. So basically ergodic means also that well if you take time you take this is observable and so this is an average on a space and the trajectory is going to converge to the average of the observable and here is the definition. So basically you have the, what you want for thermodynamics. So it's, this kind of average converts to this type. This is the time average and this is the uh, space average. Um, you say a little bit about what you mean by good statistical property? Good statistical property, basically this for instance. Ah. So if your system is, yeah, okay, good. So let's, what happened with conservative dynamics? So you have a manifold your dynamic, and here obviously you have the hard measure, the hard measure or the back measure you want, it's going to be invariant by the dynamics. And then you have the time average, and you have the space average. So with this phi, phi is a function that goes from the manifold to the real line. Okay, so good what the people call an observable. So it's some information that you observe if you produce this kind of, uh, whatever, this time series. You have this time series, and the average in time series, basically the average on a space of the map phi. What happens if dynamic is not conservative, for instance, when you have an attractor, so you do not have this map, this measure, uh, but you can say something else. You have now an attractor. So everything converts to this attractor. And what you want to say is that the, this time average is going to converge to something that depends on phi for almost any initial condition on this open set. So whatever you start, you put here on several on the attractor, so phi go from the attractor to the real line. You pick any point, any point is going to converge here. Another point is going to converge here. So when you want to say that for almost initial condition, and almost it's just a direct measure on the open set U, you are going to converge to a constant that depend on the observable, but do not depend on the initial condition for almost every point. So this is how they have so they have statistical description. F here is C1 or B? Uh, uh, F, in principle, it just says C0. So if, but if you don't want to get into measure of theoretical notion. Yeah, exactly. Six. Six. Yes. Yes, it's well, it, to set central limit theorem is more. Uh, well, yeah. but. The rate of this conversion. Yeah, it's more about, it's more like the spectrum. How do you call it? Like so it's more, it, it's more it's going on. Yeah, it's like, like a naive somebody, I can just use those words and make believe I know it's going right. on. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> it's, like, it's like you flip a coin, it's minus one and one. Okay. And say, so, well, in average, you convert to zero. Right. That's okay. okay. I don't know how uh, <laughs> conversion we convert to zero. Okay. This is like, a, okay. in fact, is. Yeah. Did you formulate any of this using a Wiener type measure instead of a hard measure, which sort of builds in the statistics into the measure? Uh, yes. So in fact, what happened that when you're doing a finite dimensional dynamical system, uh, basically you put a Gaussian measure or a they're all equivalent. Right. Okay. But this type of thing is start to be meaningful when you start to do an infinite or whatever when you have. You don't know that the measure is, is one in the whole space. So it's, it's very typical when, when the people do random matrices. So the idea is when you increase the dimension of the, you put just the, what do you call it in random matrices? Well, you put the, 
how do you call it, the equivariant measure. So the, the measure that gives the same weights to everything, right. but you don't run the measure that convert to Gaussian when the dimension goes to infinity. And so in this case, it starts to be like meaningful when you start to look at uh, different type of distribution. But in principle, you are working in a finite. Okay. It's like it, would, it wouldn't say much. Well, here is a good example about this theorem. So C1 rod transitivity implies weak hyperbolicity. People believe that oh, C2 will be the same, C3 will be the same, C4 will be the same, etc. But you put boundary on the manifold, it's false. So C2 rod transitivity does not imply hyperbolicity, neither weak form hyperbolicity. So just. <coughs> It's just an, it's a curiosity, but maybe it's a good indication why, what could fail when you move in topologies, you move up in topology. It's technical, but whatever. But this dichotomy says you have this ergodicity, but either almost every point has zero Japanese point. What does it mean? Here, when you have the pendulum, you move inside this trajectory, that this curves. Your trajectory moves inside this curve. So the Japanese point is zero. What is the Japanese point? The asymptotic rate of diversion of trajectory. It's like basically, you have two trajectories, they're going to separate in the future maybe, so you care about which is the asymptotic rate of this separation. Zero Japanese point means that, well, maybe the point separate or not, but do not separate with a constant rate. So it's like a, it's look less chaotic. The entropy is going to be zero of your system if you want to put in this term. So on once you have positive entropy and ergodicity, or you have zero entropy. And so it's possible to say I, the, any dynamic is going to be split in this two phenomena. Um, okay. It will be nice, I don't want to finish, so it will be nice if everything is robust. So you say, okay, so we already uh, say, ah, you have this theory, hyperbolicity, build up on these mechanisms, and you build up a theory. So you will say, well, this theory covers everything. No. There is, open, there is this open set uh, of dynamics which are not covered by the hyperbolicity, which is this robust transit dynamic which are not hyperbolic. Okay, but if everything is robust, you can you finish with the list. So you say, well, maybe not everything is hyperbolic. It was conjecture at some point that everything was hyperbolic. Um, generically. And then, okay, there's not a case, but everything is robust. So it's true that you have always a finite number of transitive pieces. And the answer is no. And people call this wild, dyna wild dynamics, and which is what happened. Now you have infinitely many attractors appearing and disappearing. Oh. But you have infinitely many attractors. Uh, appearing and disappearing means that when you perturb, some one of these attractors goes away, and a new one's coming into the picture. So it looks like a little bit of a mess. So a cartoon, well, here you have G1, and here these dots are attractors. Well, they're periodic attractors. And you perturb, you once attack the appears. I didn't put here, so here is granulated. Because, well, it's what happened that the theorem says that it's a residual set of dynamics that each one has infinitely many attractors. So, topology C1, C2, C3, if you go from dimension 3 up, is irrelevant. This phenomena appear in any dimension larger than equal to three, just requiring that the dynamic is C1. So this means that. Can you ever get suddenly infinitely many, I mean, can you have finite being very close to infinite, where yes. suddenly infinitely yes. many pop in and infinitely many disappear? And yes, kind of yes, exactly. And in fact, so for instance, the conjecture is that, if it's true this conjecture, that the, well, the part is conjecture, well, the, if you put, if you put family here, they have zero measure in the parameter. Mm. So yes, you can have infinitely many attractors, but it's not relevant I mean, from the theoretical point of view, a major theoretical point of view. Mm -hmm. And this is what is not clear. So 
Can you it's relevant to the number of attractors of the nearby system? Yes. So, in fact, they are more like uh, people say, well, I don't know if they have infinity, but maybe it's possible to do a statistical analysis. Uh, maybe there are few attractors, so almost every point goes to a final number of attractors. And the set of point, the measure, the set of point that they go to the rest is totally meaningless. It will be like a power law. Few attractor getting everything, and the other getting nothing, almost nothing. And this kind of uh, uh, appear and disappear is more like a, in this tail. So it's so maybe it's possible to formulate a statistical description. Right? It's like okay, you have a phenomenal attractor, but from a statistical point of view, uh, there is a power law, and so there is just the dust. And you're saying this does not happen in dimension two? No, it happened in the, it happened for the, what they say is like in dimension two, it depends on the differentiability of the system. But in dimension three and up, it does not depend. And dimension two is unknown, it depends or not. This is still an open conjecture, but, but what they say is that sometimes certain phenomena are related to the degree of differentiability. So this problem of universality, etc. But what happens in dynamic? In dynamic, what you have in low dimension, you inherit in larger dimension. Probably you just multiply it. But what happens in higher dimension, you get more, and sometimes you have more flexibility. And in fact, uh, here for C1 dynamic dimension three, this happens. So it's like a okay. But the funny thing that it was understood, again, through this analysis of mechanisms. So this is, so many, maybe what I'm telling here is not, it's more like the genesis of the theory than anything else, but it's more like it. So how people form this phenomenon? So you say, okay, you have this, the horseshoes, the small horseshoes is here, in this picture. You have the unstable set, and the stable set, and they are transversal. And if you have that, you have stability and so on. And someone say, okay, but well, forget it. Why to be transversal? Put in a tangent way. Mm -hmm. So, and the people call it critical dynamics. Why is critical dynamics? Because it's like the role of critical point in one dimension. So, for instance, you have a critical point in one. What is a critical point? The derivative of the point zero. Is the, this point is fixed? This critical point became an attractor. Mm -hmm. well, so you have a fixed point. Or periodic, then you have a track of room, everything free. So what happened in hyperbolicity? Hyperbolicity was that you have, let's say, two, zero, zero, and one third. Okay, so it's not it's not an attractor. But then multiply by zero, one, one, zero. And so now you have zero, two, one third, zero. Because the game value are smaller than one. So basically you have one dilation as a stretch, one dilation as a contract, and then inverted. So it's like it. you have to have the terminal smaller than one that you want to attract. So this is what they call critical dynamics. So you have some stretching, and suddenly became a contraction. So you're interchanging these two behaviors. Of course, this is not robust. You go, okay, so I have this, the times I move up and down, it's destroyed. But however, the what they manage, so you have this. You move, and well, now it becomes transversal, big deal. But what happens is so it's one point that you have the critical dynamics. So for it and the quadratic family, you have the critical point coming back very close to itself, and you manage to perturb it to close the critical point, then you produce this attracting periodic point, nothing else. There are no, there are no more criticalities to play around. Oh, you have one dynamics, you have a critical point, and then becomes periodic, you remove the critical point, you do not have more critical point to be playing around. So that's it, you exhaust all the critical point. But here you say, okay, I have this tangency, that's it, it's gone. What happened that this produced some kind of infinitely many critical points. So you play around, and when you zoom, you will have many phenomena, infinitely many attracting points, this horse is again, it's an attractor that I've known. And let me say why you have infinite many critical points. Okay. 
So like this. Remember that you have this, no? So when you produce this, so this manifold will come back and produce another critical point here. You will have like a kind of a counter set of critical points. So from one, you will have infinitely many of them, and then produce a critical set, infinitely many critical points. And for each of them, you have this new attractor appearing. And this kind of configuration of having infinitely many critical points, you cannot destroy all of them at the same time. It's a little bit technical, but this is a kind of a strong departure. This is from dimension one to dimension two. So this kind of critical behavior that in one dimensional dynamic is kind of isolated here became a counter set. Um, and so you have here every single star, and then you produce another tangents, and again you have the tangents, again you have the same phenomenon. You have a fractal behavior. So one tangent is you unfold and produce another tangent, but when you have a tangent again you repeat the same picture. Well, so for one of these, you produce all these phenomena. But when you have a tangent again, you have another phenomena. Uh, here you have another one, and then... And what is conjectural, all these phenomena are kind of homogeneous. What does it mean? That you see this, you're going to see this. When you see this, you're going to see this. So all these behaviors are kind of interrelated. And, and in fact, so this was like a one point it was called that I was, it's very complicated behavior that's going on down there. And if you want to do this classification, you, we build up these two new phenomena. You have this robust dynamics, like a finite transitive set, or you have this wide dynamics. So this is what I was saying that some of phenomena, not for a system, but for a perturbed system. Here are Finite, finite number of attractors, and here you have the phenomena of appear and disappearing attractors. So two different behaviors that quite different that happen in dimension one. And here you have what we call the hyperbolicity, the structure, and these tangences of critical behavior. And it was possible, what is proven, that this one are interchange, hyperbolicity produce robust transitivity, and robust transitivity produce hyperbolicity. And this too, if you have this tangency, you produce this wild dynamic, and then you can get back. If you have this wild dynamics, then there is a tangency behind it. So this is the idea that this critical behavior this is a mechanism that is essential for some type of behavior. So you want to identify, again, remember, we want to identify mechanisms of the structure which are the sole re, uh, culprit of certain behavior. And this is generic, so if you put this together, they have a generic picture. Either a system is a, is, can be approximated by a, one that is hyperbolic or by one that is, has a tangency. Okay, this is the picture in dimension two, C1 again. And you move up to higher dimension, everything is screwed up. And we say why, because there are new phenomena which are robust and do not fit here. They are robust chaotic dynamics which are not hyperbolic. In terms of mechanisms, new mechanisms appear. So this much more complicate, complicated figure of periodic trajectory, etc. Doesn't matter the name, it's called the interdimensional cycle. I will not get into detail with this. But yes, this kind of phenomena, the dimensional cycle, I kind of think they are like the culprit of non-hyperbolic robust transitive dynamics. Remember what they we build up this phenomena, this dynamic with the word robust transitive and non-hyperbolic? Well, because they have this mechanism behind. And if you combine this with this, you produce much more complicated type of wild dynamics. And this is the one that we hope that is like it produces robust wild dynamics. Robust wild dynamics is having fixed domain attractor, there's no way to destroy it. You have this kind of like the, maybe these are the sources where this conjecture that we were put on the beginning was false. But anyhow, you go back to classification. On one side, you have the robust dynamics and the wild dynamics. The robust dynamics, on the other side, when you put mechanism structure, you have the weak hyperbolicity and the tangences. 
Again, there can be interchange, but now instead of hyperbolicity that you put with hyperbolicity, still you have this combination, and C1 generically, either your map or your dynamic hyperbolic, or exhibit the tangency, or have some interdimensional cycle. And what happened at each of them, so this is a good theory, and each of these, uh, how do you call it, each of these uh, mechanism has a lot of consequences, as we said before. This produces this infinite many attractors. This produces this weak hyperbolic structure that were essential to try to prove this conjecture about uh, bodicity for conservative dynamics. And in part, people are thinking that maybe there is a kind of hierarchy of dynamics in any dimension. Here are the simplest one, this hyperbolic. That they are much more complicated than this, but they share some stability property. <coughs> this will be the guys that they are robust transitive, but it's not hyperbolic. This one will appear in tangents, but still get the more complicated phenomena in terms of. And then you have the on the top the system that they have these tangences or critical dynamics on this infinite many pieces. And maybe some kind of universal structure, what's happening in one dimension, don't get into details. And maybe there's nothing else. These are the robots and these are the wild. So this is the kind of uh, kind of a picture that is kind of is only well known that's true in low topology. What's the French done? See we yeah, see one topology. Maybe it gives an indication in higher dimension. This is a theorem. This is a theorem. And this is a, you know that this is a generic map. Yes. Yes. Yes, this other. Uh-huh. Well, no, no. So, my colleague doesn't move. So, that's it. So, this means that it went blank is because of that. <laughs> okay, no. More questions? Um, <coughs> I, I, I seem to remember from my, a long time ago, it was sort of like an experiment where you had one cylinder inside another, and the space between was filled with water, the cylinders rotated at opposite speeds, and as they sped up, the dynamics of the water changed, and then sort of, eventually it got turbulent, that was sort of like the smell of horseshoes, but the intermediate stages, if they were discontinued, there were real dramatic changes, but with like bifurcations, where some of the chloride of uh, the tractors appeared. Does that fit into this picture, or uh, are nonsense here? Well, yeah, so... Yes, I'm talking about yeah, <laughs> no, no. In fact, we're, we can talk on this on Wednesday, for it, because really, of course, this, in, this, in this case, what you have the description is a PD, so the many right. of the phenomenon is, at least all the time you want to put is OD. So the really is like... Ah, uh, I see. And what is the ratio between PD and OD? Well, you can do it. You do people do Fourier transformation, and they say, okay, forget about the, uh, the dust. Remain with the OD each as the first mode. Uh, this problem of turbulence uh, was basically saying, okay, so how you produce chaotic, so how do you relate turbulence with chaotic dynamics? Exactly, right. Um, and the problem of which is the route that you're going to produce these chaotic dynamics. Right? And so one of the main essential is say, okay, so the route to chaotic dynamics is related to this phenomena of bifurcation. Right. And you are going to get this kind of period down in bifurcation, and in the end you have this chaotic dynamics. Uh, this is much more naive description. So, what is saying that if you have, so you say, well, what is chaotic? You say here, well, you can put the entropy. And here you can put, so one way to describe, here you have zero entropy, and here you have positive entropy. Put the word topological. To say precisely which is the notion of top. Oh. So, what you can say that the interior of this is equal to the Morse smell. Now, which is Morse smell is like basically the much easier example of Morse smell. Smell is one fixed repairing point and one attracting fixed point. Mm -hmm. And here you have positive entropy. And here, what you get is a horseshoe. And in fact, in the boundary, this guy is going to be approximated by one that have an homogeneous tangent. But do not say anything which is a root going to there. So, in fact, what they will try, this is a conjecture by Charles Tresser, that what he said that for, 
So you have dimension one, dimension two. So the first step up. And the, which how one dimensional, the, the two dimensional dynamic are related to one dimensional. Say, so, okay, you put some dissipation. So the, the, the Jacobian of your dynamic is more than one. So you iterate the Jacobian goes to zero and you are going to have something that syntactically has zero Jacobian, right. which is the case of a one dimensional dynamics, okay. at least with critical point. Okay. Um, <clears throat> And in one-dimensional dynamic, the root to chaos it was going through this uh, period down in bifurcation, and the conjecture is the same dimension two, when you have a lot of dissipation. We put it, it's possible to prove the theorem. And in fact, we are going to talk on, on, on Wednesday is that, in fact, even in dimension two, when you have dissipation, you have this cascade of period doubling that is explaining why you go from zero entropy to positive entropy. So that same picture. The same picture, unless for the uh, dissipative dynamics on the on the uh, how do you say on the disk on the sphere if you want. If not, this like a, this is a place where topology and dynamics start to interplay. So the the topology of or your underlying dynamics is very relevant in terms which is the process of bifurcation. What we say here is more like a, you don't have a global picture. You say, well, somewhere something is happening. But you don't know. Here in this phenomenon, you say, well, you go to chaos and you go to the speed of that. In certain sense, you're given a global picture of, the thing, of what's going on. But here you say, well, here is a horseshoe. Right. Yeah, but where? Maybe it's a tiny one. It's, a, it's, an, it's an homogeneous tangent. But where? It's a tiny one. You do not describe the whole picture. You are just describing the semi-local part. Uh, very like a more elemental in the description. On the other hand, you have whole ice hockey classes where the entropy is positive. Yes. So there is no root. Uh, no, yeah, it's true. You see what I say? This is this depend on the class of the topology. Yeah. Right. So this this conjecture is true. Well, maybe it's true only if you are acting on the disk. In the animal, it's already false. Mm -hmm. So it's like a. Uh -huh. uh, so everything starts to be more more and so all we go into the pains on where you are acting. 